as the rest of us open our Bibles. And we're going to be opening our Bibles for the final time, at least collectively, uh, into Genesis for at least a little while. And we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. So Genesis chapter 4, beginning with verse 13, Cain said to Yahweh, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you have driven me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But Yahweh said to him, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then Yahweh put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from Yahweh's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the blessing of this day. We thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray that we would continue to grow in it, that we'd continue to grow closer to you, that our understanding would be made more full, that we would know your will for our lives, and that you would through your power, that we would be encouraged and strengthened to continue to do your will so that we would make you known and that we would make the salvation that is available through your son Jesus known so that more would be able to know you, to have life, and to be in your coming kingdom. Lord, this we pray through the name of your son Jesus. Amen. So if you've ever had the thought, you know, I want to know more about God's justice and mercy and the concept of divine protection, guess what? These are the verses that are going to help you. It starts out with Cain saying to to Yahweh, my punishment is more than I can bear. Just a quick reminder, what is it that, that Cain did that deserves punishment? Yeah, he killed his own brother. He committed the first murder. He killed his own brother. And what is his punishment? He can't be a farmer anymore, and he's made to wander. He has to leave everything that he's known. He has to leave his home. That's his punishment, and that's more than he can bear. All right, so let's look at this then. This particular section of Scripture is pretty interesting because it, it, it captures Cain's reaction to this punishment. And while the punishment may actually seem a little lenient, um, it really is, is going to show us a, quite a bit about God. Cain makes a, makes a plea to God, and God responds to that plea. And through this message, I'm hoping that we can explore these themes of divine justice and mercy, and also what is reserved for God. And as we examine them, again, a greater understanding of God's protection, the significance of his justice compared to man's. Right now, there's a a, a whole bunch of people that are yelling and screaming about this type of justice and that type of justice and one of the things that we don't hear a lot about is people actually screaming about God's justice. It's man's justice that we're concerned about and there is a big difference between the two and it'll be very obvious I hope that as we continue talking but also we're, I, I hope that we're able to look into this need for spiritual preservation uh, and that's one of the things that I think we are as a people uh, in this day and age that are, we are most in need of is that spiritual pre- preservation because it's, it's that, that understanding of who God is, that connection with them that is suffering the most in this world right now. Despite everything that we see, the physical, the outward, I think that's one of the areas where we are truly suffering the most. So first off, let's get into this. Cain's reaction reveals this, this deep despair and this perceived sense of injustice. He views this punishment, again, as more than he can bear. And it's, it's a reflection of this internal struggle. But even more so, it's his fear of the consequences. His lament about being hidden from God's presence highlights his understanding. And that's really, I think, what is the most devastating to him. It isn't necessarily the fact that he's going to be made to wander and that the the ground will not yield its fruit to him anymore. It's the fact that he's not going to be in the presence of God. That 
is, is the, the, the seriousness of his punishment. And he does recognize that. It's that separation from God's presence that, that represents that significant spiritual and emotional burden that he's going to carry. He knows he's going to carry that the rest of his life, not being in God's presence. And so this, in this, he considers this severe, he considers it a little unjust, despite the fact that God's mercy has allowed him to maintain his life, that his life is being spared despite the atrocious act that he committed. He sees this as, as not even a consideration as what the worst thing is. It's more that separation from God. And it's that initial fear of being separated from God. It's, a, it's possible and highly likely. We don't know a whole lot about the timeline here. We're just given a little bits and details. Uh, but it's highly likely that God was a big part of his life, a big part of Adam and Eve and all their children and children's children's life at this point. So this is going to be, this prospect seems unbearable. And, and that starts to make a little, bit expe- a little bit more sense. He then expresses that he's concerned that as a restless wanderer, that others are going to seek him out and seek to kill him. And again, it's unclear exactly how long after the fall this is. But it does point to the fact that Adam and Eve were probably pretty prolific by this point. Um, so these others may speak of numerous siblings, children, nieces, nephews, uh, <laughs> cousins, perhaps even grand or even great-grandchildren to this point. Again, we don't know the timeline exactly. They lived for a very long time, and it's clear that there are others that are around, other children of Adam and Eve, and perhaps even more beyond them. <clears throat> So he is worried about that. He's concerned about his own life, that they are going to take his life. He's going to be vulnerable. He's no longer in God's presence. Again, I I speak to this quite a bit. The protection that God provides over his people is his presence. And when his presence is removed, that's when they are exposed to the evils and and the, the terrible things of this world, the people of this world that want to do destruction upon his people. He simply removes his presence. He removes that protection. And Cain already understands this. And that's his concern. He's going to be vulnerable, and others may kill him, may take his life. So then God responds to this with an act of mercy. By placing a mark on Cain, God ensures that no one will take his life. This mark signifies God's protection over Cain. It is his continuing care and intervention despite Cain's sin. The fact that he took his own brother's life, God is still watching over him, caring for him, and declaring that anyone who would kill Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. And this ultimately underscores the seriousness of taking a life as well as the protection that God affords to those he marks. Despite this protection, though, Cain's punishment as a restless wanderer continues. And there's a balance of divine justice. He's made to wander. He's no longer in God's presence. But there's also that mercy God is protecting him. God is still maintaining his life. And that protection does not negate the reality of the ongoing consequences, though. We have a duality there. We have this consequence, the justice is being served, but we also have this protection, this mercy being given. And it's that type of a duality that we tend to struggle with as a society, as people. We see one or another has to happen. We have to provide justice. We have to give justice. Justice must be done. Or it's mercy. It's, it's, we, are, we are a people of all or nothing. In most cases, in most situations, especially in extreme circumstances, when a life has been taken, we tend to be one or another to an extreme. 
And that is where we have to find this, this balance. And, and God provides that balance. He is the balance of the divine justice and mercy. So we have Cain who is now departed from God's presence and is now to settle in the land of Nod. We don't know if this is just a land, an area that God had named or Adam had named prior to this. Uh, and it's still unsettled and he's going there first. Or maybe it is a land that his family has settled at this point. But it, in either way, it symbolizes this continued estrangement from God and the lasting impact of his sin. He's no longer going to be able to reside where the rest of his family is, which is where he's always been and always known God's presence. Now, we know that God is everywhere. God is present even in the land of Nod. But it is that physical separation that probably created some of the anxiety, some of the frustration that Cain is beginning to feel. And so even though we know God is everywhere, that lasting impact of you are no longer where you were with God. It's a physical representation of the spiritual separation. So the generations, oftentimes I said that we, we look at one or another, we tend to look at God and we look at his mercy and his justice and, and we, we struggle with that a little bit. I've had conversations with many people that really struggle with this idea of God's mercy and God's justice. Because some see the justice, and there are numerous examples throughout Scripture, and they see that justice as being harsh. And they miss the mercy that is evident in the Scriptures and it's evident in our lives. We look at things like Sodom and Gomorrah where God rained down sulfur fire and everyone died instantly. We see that as being harsh, and yet we don't know the full story of how many chances God gave to these two, these two cities, but we do know he at least gave them one more chance, right? He sent his angels in and gave them yet another chance. So there was mercy that was evident in that moment, in that situation. God tempers justice with mercy throughout the scriptures and throughout our lives. Others, though, they see his mercy. God is love, which means he would never, never, everyone is saved. No one is condemned to, to a lake of fire. No, God loves us too much. They get rid of the justice. They say, well, if God is love, then there is there's no need for justice because he will wash over everything and everything is forgiven. Doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter if you absolutely hate God, you can abhor him. He is terrible. He is awful. It doesn't matter. God loves you. So you don't have to believe him. You don't have to believe in him. You don't have to love him. You don't have to care for him. You don't have to believe in his son. You don't have to accept his son as savior. Hmm. You see how this gets really twisted. One way or another, we have people of extremes, and, and that is, unfortunately, our society. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm saying today, but the reality is, is I think that has been society all along. We are a people of extremes. We see God's mercy, and we think that God will forgive anything. We don't even have to ask for it. The reality is, is God will forgive anything if we ask. I still, I, still hold, I still hold true to the fact that I believe the only unforgivable sin is the one that is not asked to be forgiven. Because we see so many examples throughout the scripture of God providing an opportunity for people just to ask for forgiveness. And when they don't, that's when the sulfur rains down. That's when the earth opens up. That's when fire rains down, whatever it may be. That's when the swift sword cleaves through everyone. He provides this opportunity. We mentioned a, a birthday, and, and, and so being a parent, I can understand this delicate balance. All of us, have, have, we've had kids, we, we know this delicate balance of, of, of mercy and justice. I, I love my family, and there's nothing that will ever change that. 
I will always love my family. It doesn't matter what they say to me. It doesn't matter what they do. I will still always love them. But each one of my family members are accountable for their own words, their own deeds, and ultimately justice will be done in their lives. I can love my family, but their choices are their own. And this is exactly the way God looks at each and every single one of us. He loves us, but we make our choices, and those choices will be accountable. They will be accountable. So Cain's punishment, while it may seem severe, severe to some, because again, we're being separated from God, from a Christian, we can see that, we can understand the severity of it. Others outside of the church will look at it and say, well, it's kind of lame. He just sent him off and said, just wander around a little bit. But he didn't take his life. There was no real punishment, right? He just sent him off. So some may see it as severe, some may see it as not harsh enough. But the reality is, again, as Christians, we, not, we understand that he will no longer be in God's presence. And while God will still be there, he is not, does not have that relationship that he had. That relationship, which wasn't very good to begin with, obviously, that's where we led to this situation already, but he's going to be made to wander, and he does not feel like he's in God's presence anymore. That is the severity of this punishment. And we've already touched on that significance of being apart from God and how terrible that is. And that wandering just continues to make it worse. It's more devastating for him. He's, he's always been a farmer. He is, he's literally put down roots, and that's no longer an option for him. So this, this punishment that's levied against him has changed everything. Everything that he has known, he is made to leave, to walk away from, because of his own choices. This is the justice that God has levied against him. This is God's justice. But there is still compassion in that justice. Again, we see this in, 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 immediately in response to this heinous act. He, he, he tempers this justice with that mercy. Rather than striking him down, he just simply casts him out. We would have a hard time doing the same thing. If someone were to murder another person, we would have a really hard time just saying, you know what, we're just going to cast you out. We're going to make it so that your life is no longer the things that you used to be able to do. You can't do that anymore. You're going to wander. You're going to be separated from God. Most people wouldn't even care. You're going to be separated from God. Who cares? That would be most people's attitude. It wouldn't even be a punishment. Most people would call for, for hang them, electric chair, whatever it is. Life imprisonment. Lock them up and throw away the key. That would be most people's response and reaction. And the worst part of that is, while some punishment needs to obviously be enforced, the worst part of that is, is if someone does something wrong to you, and I, I touched on this a couple last week or the week before, if there's no forgiveness in your heart, someone did, did this, if there's no forgiveness in your heart, you continue to suffer. You continue to be separated from God. And I mentioned this being, uh, touching on this, the, the school showed it shooting years, decades ago in the Amish community. Lives were taken, young lives were taken, and yet the families of those, lo of those that were lost gave forgiveness to that shooter. That's an example of that mercy and justice. That is an example. One, because they're doing exactly as God had done with Cain, but they're also relieving themselves of that burden, of that anger, of that hatred, the things that will ultimately, if we hold on to them, ultimately separate us from God. 
we hold on to these things and we and we have this hatred for our for our fellow man for our fellow image bearers of God and that's what separates us from him he provides protection over Cain He continue is he's continuing to give him opportunities to turn back from where he was, where that heart is that led down this path to begin with. And he even puts that mark on him to make sure that he would be protected from others, that no one would take his life. And, and we look at that and we say, okay, so God's protecting him. But he's also protecting those around him. By placing that mark on, God, on Cain, God is establishing his sovereignty in administering justice and mercy. This is all a reminder that the ways of God are higher than our ways, that his judgments are perfect. This idea of being reserved for God highlights that ultimately all things are under God's control and authority. We take things into our own hands, but ultimately God is the one that has the power and authority. Even in punishment, God's protection and providence will prevail. In marking Cain, God is preserving his life while also protecting and maintaining the innocence of those around him. To this point in history, only one life had been taken. And that was the sacrifice that God made to clothe Adam and Eve. And now we have a second life is taken. And God is trying to establish right from the beginning that taking that life was a great offense. You take the life of another and you will be cast out of God's presence. They've already been cast out of the garden of that physical presence with him, but now that relationship is shattered even more if you take the life of another. And he's trying to emphasize this. I think this is a teaching lesson here. God is all about teaching lessons. You read through the scripture, it's all about teaching lessons. And I think that lesson was lost on the people then, and it is certainly lost on the people today. And that lesson is that life is precious. It is a gift. Our almighty God created all life. That is his dominion, not ours. Outside of, of childbirth, the giving and taking of life is reserved for God. And I would say, I would go so far as to say even in childbirth, that is still God's dominion. That is his power, his authority that is there. He displays how dear life is by sparing Cain's life and by protecting his life. Cain's story demonstrates the lasting consequence of sin. We can see that in being made to wander, being taken out of God's presence. But the ongoing repercussions of our sin, of those actions, of taking another life, of even being hateful or hateful towards another person, that carries those lasting consequences. It sits in our hearts. And it continues to separate us from God. But this story also emphasizes God's grace. In His infinite patience and wisdom, God's justice is tempered by a healthy dose of mercy. This underscores the importance of avoiding sin and seeking reconciliation with God. He provides the time. He provides the opportunity to reconcile. He's giving us time to take advantage of the opportunity. And while we may have done that once when we went through the waters of baptism, it's a daily thing. It's a every hour, every other minute, maybe every minute where we need to reconcile with God, where we need to seek His forgiveness. 
Cain's story is multiple layers of tragedy. But it also points to the need for repentance and the possibility, the wonderful possibility of restoration. Even in the face of punishment, there is room for God's mercy. There's room for his grace. And just as God protected Cain, we can trust in God's protection and we can trust in his provision for our lives. Recognizing that God's sovereignty encompasses all aspects of our existence, including our safety and well-being. Even if we have gone down that road, even if we have committed a horrible sin, something atrocious, he gives us the opportunity to be forgiven, to ask for that forgiveness and to receive it. We have to be mindful constantly of sin that is in our life. Oh, it's always there. We have to be mindful of it, and we have to strive to live a life that ultimately honors God, aiming to walk in his righteousness. When confronted with sin or wrongdoing, we need to be seeking reconciliation with God, but also with others. Embracing repentance and restoration, understanding that is part of who we are in relationship with God. It's not just about God is loving and he cares for us. We have to be constantly seeking that restoration with him. Knowing that his mercy is readily available. We need to understand and align with God's will in our life. We need to acknowledge that all things are under his control and seek to live in accordance with his purposes. Embrace who you are as being reserved, a reserved possession of God, his creation, his image bearer. And live out your calling with gratitude, knowing that you are set apart for his purposes and protected by his grace. And always acknowledge him and praise him. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for the blessing of this day. We thank you that your, in, in your infinite patience and wisdom, you provide us with opportunities, you provide us with time to be reconciled to you, to ask and seek that forgiveness, to repent of our sins, to turn away from them and turn to you. We are grateful for the many blessings, but that blessing is truly the greatest that we have that you provide us. And Lord, I just thank you for that. I thank you that we have that opportunity through your son, Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that we would continue to feel your presence among us, that we continue to be led and guided by you and by your will, that you would provide us with strength in the meal that we're about to receive, that you are providing us in strength in the fellowship that we are partaking in, and that we would continue to draw closer to you all through the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.